Welcome to our discussion today. We are going to be talking about salvaging drought stress crops. I am here with Jack Davis, who is the SDSU Extension Crops Economics Field Specialist, and Dan Forgey, who is a farm manager uh, for Cronin Farms near Gettysburg, South Dakota, a diversified crop and livestock operation there. So today we wanna to discuss some of the economics behind making decisions when we're talking about whether to leave some of these drought stress crops standing or what decisions we should make uh, moving forward. Do we wanna use them as forage, leave them standing um, or what can we do? What are some of the best options we have? So I'm gonna turn it over to Jack here first and Dan as well to talk a little bit about some of the things we should consider when we're trying to determine what that crop is worth. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Uh, you know, um, we're just gonna have to probably get in that field and get some good estimates, probably first to maybe tonnage, you know, I think we can use some rules of thumb. The, the one is a, a, a foot of height will get you a ton, but boy, if it's all burned up, that, that may not get to that. You know, that's kind of talking where you maybe have some green and, and stuff left. And the other thing that we've talked about just a, a little bit here is, is knowing where that feed value of what you got. So taking an inventory, you know, inventories of your herd and what you have for crops and what you might want to harvest. Yeah, what are you guys seeing out there, Dan? You know, Jack, it's, uh, uh, thanks, sir, for putting this on, but uh, Jack, we're seeing a little bit of everything. Our corn is fairly tall. It's uh, probably six to eight foot tall, but our, we're really worried about our ears are going to start tipping down. They're going to be probably light. And uh, I was wondering what your thoughts were if, if, uh, if there's some way, like right now, if you could some way find out the feed value of that corn, if you cut it, uh, uh, if you cut it off like maybe a foot tall and and, uh, and then uh, send a biomass sample in to somebody to find out the feed value. And then you could kind of plan on maybe how long it's gonna take you into the fall or winter. And, and what's your thoughts, Jack, on that? I mean, is, I don't know if that's a good plan or not. Well, I think it gives you, a, a, to me, Dan, if you can get it done in a decent fashion in a timely manner, it gives you an idea of what you got out there. That's a, just a tough, tough thing with drought. There's so much uncertainty on what we have out there and, and you know, um, for the producer, the thing on drought is, is cash flow and protecting your equity. And boy, you're just dealing with a lot of uncertainty. So I think that's a great idea if you have a, a method of either just maybe you run the, if you, if you can get a chopper out there and chop it or get some way to um, do whole plant and grind him up and, and get some tests done. Yeah. Another thing, uh, Jack is, is, uh, you know, I'm concerned. I mean, I, I saw something from you guys on SDSU about on the value of your residue. And so like, uh, we don't wanna, we don't wanna remove anything from the field. We do not have to. And so I think that, uh, I think you guys as calculator to be really, even though it's a, 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 a short crop, a droughty crop, there's still some value there for especially snow catch in this droughty area, but uh, the, I think a lot of it going on and, and then we get run into the deal with us is uh, we I'm pretty sure we're going to have light corn. I hope not. I hope it's like the wheat. I hope we're surprised. So, I mean, how would you, how do you think a guy could handle light corn, Jack? I mean, uh, could a guy put a number to it as a, the feed value, well, even though if you ear leaves in light, it still should have a feed value that's worthwhile and still leave your residue or what's your thoughts? Yeah, I, you know, I think that's what you, a guy might want to take a look at. And those are some, uh, as we talked on, maybe getting in that field and getting some samples. Maybe you can do, just as you suggested, do a whole plant deal, um, send that in for a test, and then maybe just do him as, as your ear leach. Pick off an ear leach if you could get him uh, ground up to that size and send that in for uh, a nutrition test and see what you got. So yeah. then you get some more certainty back for, for you as a manager to, to make a decision that, and that, like we talked early, that's the tough part is just so much uncertainty. But if you could start doing some of the things you're mentioning, Dan, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. 
you know, there's a big part of the country out here, like, uh, and I've been over quite a bit of it, uh, like West Sully and, and, and Hughes County, like we've had 4.26 inches of rain since the first of April. And so like, as far as planting the cover, that bothers me taking it off. One thing I think we have to be sure to do, even though it's gonna hurt this year, when that's have the silage cutter, do not cut too low, not only for the nitrate, but also to save, get some snow catch and then be ready. If it, if it rains or something, I don't enough to where I don't care what we do, we'll try to get some winter wheat or rye or something out there uh, just to, for ground cover. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, that, I would agree with that, Dan. You know, uh, we're in, we're, I'm a little farther east than you, so 37, 281 type, and we got a little more moisture, but there, as some of the small grains came off, uh, guys um, got some covers in, and some of those took off and some didn't, and it was just whether you caught that rain or, or were able to do it. And boy, as we're getting late in the fall, I, you know, just... I wouldn't just, um, I don't think you'd want to cut a, a corn crop if it doesn't have any value to you as, as no. feeding or very little, let's say. No. If it has very little value in this dry situation, maybe you can leave it and like Dan said, uh, catch some snow and help you out for next year. You know, I don't know if you guys have experienced it, Jack. I, it's been a few years, but uh, we tried bailing it one year cutting it and bailing it and you really we really ran into a mess because uh you know with the baler you disturb a lot of the soil and you and i didn't and you couldn't leave but you cut too low and and i i'm not saying that uh you know people should stay away from it but i'd personally i'd really be leery of that yeah uh, i mean there's, i really would there's more moisture in that stock than people think right. too it's, it's hard to get it to dry yeah. down and it's hard on equipment i have not <laughs> I personally, and uh, I have not seen good situation trying to bale green corn or or sometimes even the the sorghum. You know, yeah. it just it it can lay and lay and lay, and once our days start getting shorter, it just gets tough to tough to dry out. Um, you know, there's a the through this whole thing. I mean, and. And I, I think the more a guy can get the word out that we have to protect our soil, we have to try to keep it from blowing by either leaving residue or leaving, but like we have some corn, that our, our worst corn is planted on sunflower stalks, which isn't a very good rotation, but it's there. So they cut that and then they're right up against black and that ground was probably blowing last spring. And I think we really have to be aware of that. And that's another thing, if a guy could, and I know you guys have it at SDSU. I know Anthony talked about it in Mitchell about the, the uh, value of that soil blowing or what you're losing there. And I think we have to put all them things together because we have to, we have to work out of this. And with you guys' help, I really appreciate these, this meeting that you're having these, these uh, uh, videos because uh, this is how we're going to learn and how to try to get out of this. Yeah. I um, you know, just on that on that same note, coming back to, gosh, um, maybe you have to leave some of it out there. You know, we, uh, fertilizer was bought pretty decent this spring for the crop. We just hopefully grew. Um, and it, it's not going to be the same deal come going forward. You, you know, uh, if these, if grain prices stay decent and the fertilizer companies have, have got themselves in a position where they can command a little more for fertilizer, it's, it's gonna be more expensive to put next year's crop in to, to get a decent yield. The, the other thing I'd like to add just a little bit, there, there is probably decent forage in South Dakota. It's just maybe not all in the right position. So if you're, you know, guys might wanna think about connecting with somebody east further that may have that that somewhat droughted out corn and, and can do some feeding for them, uh, taking care of their herd or, or whatever. You know, so those are some options for guys to think about too. Jack, if you were gonna bring cattle in uh, custom graze, I mean, what should you look for? I mean, what, how do you, should you protect yourself? Uh, like, uh, I know probably make sure they, they move the fence or, uh, 
uh, so much rather do? Or what's your thoughts on that? Because you can't just let turn them in the field and let them graze it to the ground. I mean, what's your thoughts on that as a as, to help a producer protect himself? So are you are you putting the cows out or are you taking the cows in or, or either way? We would be taking cows in. If cows we were in. Jack would be taking cows in. Yeah. So you probably got to have a, a, a probably a good, pretty good test on that um, feed that they're going to be eating. And you wouldn't want to get into a nitrate uh, situation or what's What's with if you're doing sorghum when it freezes the prussic prussic acid? Yep. Sarah, am I getting the right word there? Yep. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's there's some quality concerns yeah. there, and yep. and those are things I think uh, producers know, but you just got to make sure you're aware of that. And if that freeze is coming up, you got to be able to 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 move them. Um, and and I'm I'm like you, Dan. Uh, you'd want to work with the guy that's sending you the cows and say, okay, well, this is what we got estimated and we're not going to graze yeah. it down short we're not going to get them in trouble and yeah. here's what we're thinking so just a lot of communication and and getting out there and finding out as much as you can yeah i know this sir you'll probably talk about this later you'll have but one thing i'd like to see addressed is is the amount of like if you were going to graze corn and say we have 50 bushel corn excuse me 50 pound corn I mean, how much, how much is too much corn for a cow or when you graze and, and how much uh, fodder or, uh, you know, do you have to give them? But I know you'll probably touch on that later, but I think a lot of uh, producers are going to have that, you know, what a lot of questions on that. Absolutely. I think that, you know, there's some important things to think about when whether we leave the corn standing or if we yeah. leave the corn standing and use it as forage, we can do both of those things. And like you said, not grazing it down too far, Jack, um, is really important too. So when you take all those things into consideration, um, that will be an entire segment. We are going to talk just about grazing corn. Yeah. But I think when we talk about the, the economic side of it, that's really important too, because like you said, Dan, a lot of people are going to be in that situation this year that maybe never have. I mean, it's yeah. not a terribly common practice, uh, yeah. not a bad practice, but it's something that generally when we write forage articles and when I talk about that option, we always advise people to talk to um, you know, some kind of livestock spe specialist before they even consider it because yeah. there's a lot of caution to be taken, but it can work. So yeah. I think that's a really good point. And it may be one of the best options for some of these cornfields where the people really need the forage. Um, that may be the easiest way to do it because you're not losing everything. You know, you lose a percentage through the cow, yeah. right? But we're not losing all those nutrients. We're getting a lot of that back and you're not having to do anything mechanically, but move a fence. Yeah. So I think that might be one of the benefits and we will have a segment for people to tune into Good. on that. Good. And I, I don't, um, this is kind of just uh, going, a thought that came um, and not necessarily economics, but uh, a lot of them, like when they're grazing the uh, um, forage that's been laid in the windrow, will go perpendicular versus parallel to, to uh, windrows. And I don't know if that would, uh, if you do that in corn or if you just would run parallel. I don't, I don't know that the grazing situation makes a, a difference. I, I don't know that, but it's all those things that uh, you have to educate yourself on. Yeah, yeah. There's just a lot of factors. Yeah, yeah. there's yeah. a lot of factors. And, and I think you two have covered um, a lot of the things to think about on this topic very well. I think we want to make it clear to people that there is no cut and dry answer and it's going to be different in every situation. We can't give you a spreadsheet and say this is what you should do. Um, but these are all things to think about. We really want to think about the value of that crop before we just make a, a split reaction or do something because that's the way we've done it before. Yeah. Um, maybe this is the time to really think about why we're doing some of these things. And maybe this will be a year when it's tight for a lot of people and we need to be careful um, you know, what we're doing and, and watch our bottom line. But I, I appreciate both of you. Do, do you have any last closing comments you want to add? The only thing I want to say, Sarah, is I'm really glad you guys are doing this because you're far enough ahead of the game where a guy can make plans. So I hope producers listen to this and I hope they take something from these series you have on because I think it's really an important thing to, to help the state get through this with the livestock. 
Well, thanks, Dan. I, I hope so too. And I hope people can learn from one another. You know, Anthony mentioned uh, in an interview we did earlier that what's probably most important is that producers learn from one another because yeah. there's just no yeah. flat black and white answers in these situations. Yeah. So I, I wanna thank you two. And I wanna thank the South Dakota Soil Health Coalition for partnering in this effort with SDSU Extension. Uh, I'm Sarah Bowder, uh, SDSU Extension Agronomy Field Specialist, and we appreciate you listening today. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.